Welcome to the Pituitary Network Association's webinar presentation with Dr. Theodore Swartz. Uh, the presentation will begin shortly. My name is Linda Rio and I'm the Director of the Professional and Patient Education for the PNA. I just wanted, while we're waiting here, I wanted to let all of you who logged in early to know a little bit about a whole series of our webinar programs. We have a nice new um, visual, thanks to D uh, Tammy here at the PNA, who has kind of uh, giving you some advanced uh, information about the upcoming webinars. Just to let you know, all of our presenters have most generously volunteered their time, which of course is more than just the hour of the broadcast time today. Our presenters have amazing credentials and are folks most of us would never have the chance to just listen to and then to be able to actually ask them specific questions. This is such a great opportunity. And remember, it is most wonderful to hear the presentation live so you can have a chance to actually type in the questions directly and get a response right away. But when it isn't possible to attend the PNA web webinars live, you can anytime listen and view any of our prior programs through the PNA's website library. Being able to access our new extensive library of webinar presentations is a valuable member benefit, along with many of the other benefits of membership that include our newest website, www.pituitarybooks.com, where you can easily purchase books, t-shirts, hats, and all kinds of things that um, promote the awareness to the general public, as well as help keep the PNA alive. We do need all the help we can get. The PNA also produces brochures that help educate about many various pituitary and endocrine disorders. We host and co-host some of them uh, with some of the amazing medical centers, live educational programs, such as the all-day conference for physicians that will be held in November in conjunction with Cornell University and Dr. Schwartz's group. So thank you to him. We also have a discussion board that's available to members and of course a monthly newsletter uh, called Highlights, which provides so much valuable information. It just it just always amazes me that our editor is being able to put together so much information uh, in there, all in one place. And of course, there's so much more. I could go on and on. The PNA has no government funding, and we operate mostly from generous gifts and grants that are obtained, as well as your membership fees. So I, I on behalf of PNA, want to thank you for being here today. I'm most certain you will benefit greatly from the information that's offered here. I want you to tell your family and friends to uh, join the PNA to be able to make use of uh, going into the website to uh, be able to see all the information as well as uh, to see the webinars. I think they could be very helpful for family members to learn about, to understand. I also want uh, you to know about uh, the uh, new book that is coming out in ebook form. Uh, we have, it will be out just shortly. I can't tell you an exact date, but it is finished and it will be out. It is the uh, Pituitary uh, Patients Resource Guide, and so uh, that is, is coming out real shortly for you. Also, uh, just in May, this last May, um, the book, the textbook, Pituitary Disorders Diagnosis and Management, is available for purchase through the PNA as well as other bookstores. And this book is an amazing resource uh, for physicians, your doctors, your primary care doctors, your um, OBGYNs, your uh, internal medicine doctors, lots of doctors can, that might be ancillary to your treatment can really benefit from the information that's contained in here. We have an am amassed an amount of, um, amazing amount of information from a lot of uh, the top doctors and this is the latest information, medical information. So I do want everyone to, um, to let your doctors know, uh, let them know about the site, because then you help develop a team, your own te treatment team, that can be uh, most helpful to you. We need to have people surrounded with information and to surround yourself with good, solid people that understand as much as possible what you're going through. The PNA is here to try to help you with that, and, uh, and, and again, we are here for you. So in just a short minute or so, we are going to begin the webinar today. So thank you very much.
Hello? Yeah. Hi, I'm on. Dr. Schwartz, I hear you. This is Linda Rio. Oh, hi. Hi. Hello. Um, I, I believe we're going to be meeting up again in, uh, in a few months in Cornell, but I uh, would like to say hi to you today, and thank hello, you very hello. much. I would like to, since you're here and you're ready, I would like to provide an introduction, and then I will let you um, begin the program. Great. So hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar program presented by the Pituitary Network Association. My name is Linda Rio. I'm a marriage and family therapist by trade and I'm also the director of the Pituitary uh, Network Association's ed Education uh, Department. And we have an amazing presenter here today, Dr. Theodore Schwartz. I'd like to give you just a little bit of information. I cannot possibly do him justice, but I will just provide some highlights. Uh, Dr. Schwartz is Professor of Neurosurgery and Neurology and Otolaryngology. He's the Director of Pituitary and Epilepsy Surgery, Co-Director of Surgical Neuro-Oncology Brain and Spine Center uh, uh, Director, uh, Epilepsy Research Laboratory Brain and Mind Research Institute, and the Weill Cornell Medical College, New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. Uh, Dr. Schwartz received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard University, uh, which he, where he graduated with honors. He completed advanced fellowship training at Yale New Haven Medical Center in the surgical treatment of brain tumors and epilepsy. He specializes in image-guided minimally invasive surgery such as endoscopy, stereotaxis, microsurgery, and intraoperative brain mapping. He's received numerous awards, which I cannot begin to go into, but uh, just amazing, as well as fellowships. He is the director of a research laboratory investigating novel techniques for imaging and treating epilepsy. He's provided commentary for numerous television shows, including ABC, NBC, CBS, as well as appearing on Larry King Live several occasions, national radio television shows, He's been uh, quoted and published in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the da New York Daily News. Um, he's been peer review, appeared in peer-reviewed journals in basic science as well as clinical journey, journals. He's been named one of New York's super doctors, New York Magazine's best doctors, and America's best surgeons for several years. He's also, in addition to all of that, co-authored two textbooks. He teaches as well as both nationally and internationally. He's lectured in China, Brazil, Singapore, India, Canada, Mexico, and Austria. My goodness. Um, I'm glad we reached so many countries and um, will be represented here by our, uh, our uh, attendees. Without any further ado, I do want to remind all of you, you can type in questions to which Dr. Schwartz will be able to respond to as many as possible at the end uh, following his presentation. So please welcome Dr. Theodore Schwartz. Linda, thank you so much for that very generous and flattering uh, introduction. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, I, uh, here we go. I want to show you my screen. Let me just uh, get myself hooked up here, make sure that you guys can see what um, I have here. Can you see my computer? Any responses? Linda, are you still yes, there? Yes, I, I am here, and yes, you are up and going, and it looks wonderful. Uh, okay. okay, good. Great. Okay, perfect. So um, I am indeed a, a professor of neurosurgery and specialize in pituitary tumor surgery. And it's something that I've really dedicated a large uh, percentage of my career and my interests to over the years. You know, most neurosurgeons kind of train in general neurosurgery, and some of us decide to focus on, on particular things. And really, pituitary tumors are, are probably the, the uh, tumor that I treat most commonly in my practice. And, and one of the things I've really focused on is the introduction of endoscopy. Um, to the surgical removal of pituitary tumors. And, you know, surgery is so common in the treatment of pituitary tumors 
except for prolactinomas, the majority of our pituitary tumors are removed that way. And I'm going to go through a lot more detail. And, and some of you may know some of this stuff, and, and some may be new to some people. But, you know, I've, I feel very strongly that endoscopy adds a large advantage in the surgical removal of pituitary tumors. And I myself was never trained in these techniques and had to really pick them up on my own and, and collaborate with an otolaryngologist. And that's really an ears, nose, and throat doctor who specializes in endoscopic sinus surgery in order to develop this field. And now, as most of you know, who sort of have dealt with the, the area of pituitary tumors, it's proliferating pretty rapidly, although there still are some surgeons who don't use the endoscope. So I want to kind of talk about endoscopy and pituitary uh, tumors. I work out of Cornell, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital. It's on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I'm a New Yorker. Uh, I was born and raised in Manhattan and then spent some time up in Boston and then came back to New York. Um, and we started this institute for minimally invasive skull base and pituitary tumor surgery because it was a new field and, and I working with a guy named Dr. Vijay Anand really started to push the frontier of this field and, and wrote two books on it as you heard and trained people in it because a lot of people are interested in using these techniques. So uh, just some background on pituitary tumors. They're one of the most common benign brain tumors that exist. Um, they represent anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of all intracranial tumors and are found in about 10 percent of uh, autopsy patients. And I often tell that to my patients who come with pituitary tumor who feel like they don't know anybody who has this. And I say, well, you know, there are probably a lot of people in the world who have these. They're just not always symptomatic and we don't always need to treat them. Um, the incidence of acromegaly, for example, is, is approximately three per million. Um, and if you think about it, that's much more common than one would think it would be, which because that's really only one subtype of uh, of pituitary tumor. So here's a picture of a giant pituitary tumor, and I'm going to show you some MRI scans with tumors. And and the way I've put this talk together, there's big green arrows showing where the tumor is, because I what's very obvious to me is where a tumor is um, is often not that obvious to uh, other people. Um, I'm going to try to use my uh, there's a way to get a pointer here. Um, let me see if I can do that. Uh, I know there's a button. Here's the button. Sorry. So that I can highlight things. So in this situation, usually the tumor is this big uh, white thing pushing up on the brain. This is a particularly large tumor. And, and I'll show you some other examples of tumors and what they look like before and after surgery. So why do we do surgery for pituitary tumors? Because not everybody who has a pituitary tumor needs to have surgery or goes to surgery. We'll talk about who we choose to do surgery on. But first and foremost, Sometimes these tumors get quite big, and when they get big, they push on optic nerves, and people start to lose their vision. So um, we like to do surgery to reduce the pressure of the tumor on the optic nerves and, and restore vision when it's lost. And some people also will start to lose pituitary function because the tumors are so big. And by taking the tumor out, we can decrease the pressure on the pituitary gland uh, and restore some of its function. The other types of tumors that we operate on are tumors that actually make hormones uh, and cause diseases like Cushing's disease or acromegaly, uh, and in some cases elevated prolactin. Uh, and we can take the tumor out and in many cases, most cases, uh, cure the patients of their endocrine hyperactivity, although unfortunately not in all cases. Um, we want, of course, to maintain or improve existing pituitary function. We don't like it when we operate on someone who has a normal pituitary function afterwards. They lose their pituitary function, so that is also a goal of our surgery. And then of course we want to decrease the morbidity, which means trying not to hurt somebody uh, and only help them. And then sometimes we do surgeries in preparation for further therapy. Some people go on and have radiation therapy, even chemotherapy, and our surgery will help uh, uh, sort of guide that further therapy. So why do we operate on patients with pituitary tumors? Well, Growth hormone uh, production, that is tumors that cause what's called acromegaly, uh, is one of the uh, leading uh, reasons that we uh, do pituitary surgery. There are medications that you can take for acromegaly, um, and sometimes these medications are done in lieu of surgery, and there is a lot of debate about that, but if there's a high chance of curing someone, and I'll talk a little bit about what factors we look for that can help us cure someone of ac acromegaly. But if your growth hormone is not overly high and your tumor is not invading uh, you know, certain places that we can't remove, the, the cure rate is actually pretty high. It's almost 80 percent. Um, but there are some factors that decrease and increase that. And, and what I noted here was that 
there's a little uh, debate as to whether you should keep patients on the octreotide before surgery or not. And most people are leaning towards uh, keeping patients on octreotide. It, it can uh, decrease the swelling in the back of the throat if you have a thick tongue, uh, and it can make surgery more safe uh, and, and shrink the tumor a little bit before surgery. Um, the other major indication, the second one, are non-secreting hormones, uh, non-secreting tumors, excuse me, that have a mass effect, meaning that push on the optic nerves as we discussed, we, we remove those. The thyrotropic ones, the ones that make thyroid hormone, are very, very rare. Uh, and, and in fact, I've never seen one in my practice, and I've been doing this for 13 years. So they're extremely rare, um, but they can happen. Uh, apoplexy, what is apoplexy? Well, that's when you have a hemorrhage into your tumor. And that can happen. It's more common with prolactin-producing tumors, but it can occur with other tumors when they outgrow their blood supply or if you have a spike in your blood pressure on anticoagulants. And we operate urgently on those patients if uh, vision starts to get worse right away, but sometimes we can wait a little bit before we operate on those as well. Uh, prolactinomas are controversial as to when to operate on them. I generally offer patients medical therapy first, but we do operate on prolactinomas, particularly when your prolactin is low, uh, and that's roughly less than 500, and there's no cavernous sinus invasion. And that means that we have a chance of curing the patient. So we like to operate on them when we can cure them. And if not, we try medicine. And then if medication does not work, then we will, uh, of course, potentially operate on a prolactinoma as well. Um, if a patient is asymptomatic with a non-hormone-producing tumor, it has no mass effect, and it's less than a centimeter, we tend not to operate. Uh, but if it's greater than a centimeter, you know, it gets towards the large side and has some mass effect, we'll operate on it. And then of course, larger prolactinomas, uh, we do try to treat with medications first for the most part. So what about endoscopy? Well, we've been doing pituitary surgery for years uh, with a microscope. Why should we switch to using an endoscope? What, what's the advantage of using an endoscope? And the advantage is really the following technical reason. When we use a microscope, your lens and your light source, the microscope itself, sits outside of the nasal cavity. So when you're looking down the tube, whether it's the nostrils or whether you make an incision under the lip, you still are looking down a narrow tube and you have a limited field of view. And you really can see only what's in the midline. You really can't see stuff off to the side. When we use an endoscope, which is very much like a long thin telescope, we can advance this down the tube. And then our lens and our light source are at the end of the tube and we can look around. And we can suddenly see around corners. And we have endoscopes that actually look off to the side. So we can see these areas that we couldn't see with the microscope. So that's really the main advantage. You get to see more. Um, but the endoscope is not always helpful, but in many cases it is. It's helpful on the approach. It's helpful during when we remove the tumor. Um, and we'll talk about hormone-producing microadenomas and macroadenomas. It's helpful when we close, and it's helpful at reducing complications. So it's helpful at everything, although it's probably least helpful in microadenomas. And the reason why is that the microadenomas, the small tumors, are in the midline. So you can usually see them pretty well with a microscope. So this is kind of what surgery looks like. Um, this is a very handsome guy. This is me. Um, so uh, the endoscope sits here. I use a, an endoscope holder, which holds the endoscope in place. And all you see are the nostrils. That's We do the whole surgery just going right up to the nostrils. We use our instruments to look through the nostrils. And I'm looking off at a screen. There's a monitor right here that shows me all the imaging that I need. Um, and so this is really what the surgery looks like. The endoscope is going in one nostril, and then I'm using instruments in the other nostril. And as you see, there's, we try to minimally manipulate uh, the nose itself, um, but there's no incisions whatsoever. So it's really what we call minimal access uh, surgery. We take out tumors. We try to take them out in one piece, try to find that capsule around the tumor and take them out. So here's the only sort of gross uh, images I'm going to show you, which is taking out a pituitary tumor using an endoscope, and um, the, um, sorry, I feel like it's zipping around, but the tumor uh, came out in one piece. This is the normal pituitary gland. The green fluid is actually cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which we dye green at our institution. And then we're using an endoscope to look up at the bottom of the normal pituitary gland. We're taking out a little piece of tumor. So that's kind of what it looks like when we take out a little uh, pituitary tumor. And this is the normal gland that we try to preserve. And you can see the endoscope moving around a little bit and how we, we scoop the uh, tumor into the suction to get it all out. I have another video, um, which is my last video I'm going to show you here. 
So that's the normal pituitary gland. And the tumor is hiding in the normal pituitary gland. And you can actually cut into it and take a little piece of the normal pituitary gland out and we'll leave the rest of it intact. But you see here's the tumor sitting right uh, in this area. And we carefully dissect the tumor free from the surrounding pituitary gland. And there's a little bit of blood around the outside and we control that. But we try to scoop it out in one piece. And so really this is that evil pituitary tumor that's causing all the problem. And if you can scoop it out in one piece like this and get it all out and save the normal pituitary gland, then the patient's chance of cure is very, very high. There's, you see the border. There's the normal pituitary gland in back. And we're just kind of scooping it out. And then we pull it out. There's the tumor, all the whole thing. We take it out and the patient is cured. This patient had Cushing's disease and we were able to cure her with that surgery. All right, so let's go to some uh, statistics. This is a, a paper that we had written many years ago where we looked at cure rates. Um, and this is just the rate of gross total tumor resection uh, with a number of different uh, articles that had been published on uh, endoscopic surgery. And the gross total tumor resection rate was about 80%. So about 80% of the time, we can get the whole tumor out. And you have to understand, some of these tumors are very, very large. So 80% are, are pretty good numbers. And that's what you can expect. Um, what about for hormone-producing tumors? What are the chances of hormone resolution? And again, that's about 80%. That's this number here. Some were higher. Um, ours was a little bit higher. Some were a little bit lower. But roughly, you get about 80% cure rate. So the endocrine cure rates for growth hormone producing tumors are about 84%, prolactin producing tumors 82%, cortisol 81%. So unfortunately, we can't tell everybody you have a 100% cure rate if your tumor is making uh, hormones, but the rates are pretty good. And the rates are higher with smaller tumors. The smaller the tumor, the more successful we're going to be at curing you and with big tumors. But even with big tumors, the rates are not zero. They could be 50%, and that's actually pretty good. Um, it's just not as high as 80% or 90% in the really small tumors. Um, this was another paper that we wrote on uh, transphenoidal endoscopic surgery just for growth hormone producing tumors, and so patients who have acromegaly. And what we found was that your growth hormone level was important and that the patients who we were able to get into remission um, actually had uh, slightly lower uh, serum growth hormone levels. And in terms of the size, the tumor volume, this is the volume of the tumor, we were obviously able to get gross total resection rates and remission rates were much higher. So this is remission. If the tumors were less than two centimeters, you're more likely to get a remission. And if they were bigger than two centimeters, you're much less likely to get a remission. And again, if they were less than two centimeters, more likely to get a gross total resection rate. So that was a cutoff that we found to be uh, significant in terms of cure rates for acromegaly. Um, this was another paper looking at uh, uh, criteria for cure on acromegaly. And the reason I mention this is that the way we define cure for hormone-producing tumors has actually changed over time. And that's very important because if you compare someone's results now with someone's results 20 years ago, the criteria have gotten much more strict. So it's much harder for us to cure patients and that because we know more about the disease. We, what we, people who we thought were cured in the past are actually not necessarily cured by the most rigid, strict criteria that currently exist. So definition of cure for a female for prolactinoma less than 20 nanograms per milliliter, for a male less than 15, uh, for Cushing's disease, ACTH fasting in the morning less than 1.8 micrograms per milliliter, or a normal 24-hour urine cortisol. And this was the one that recently changed was growth hormone, normal IGF-1 plus an oral glucose tolerance test where your growth hormone is less than 0.4. This number was higher before. So you, it's a much more strict criteria, which is why the cure rates have gone, actually gone down a, a little bit if you look at more modern literature. Um, so in 86 patients with functional adenomas, 63% um, were macro, 21% had cavernous sinus invasion. Our cure rate for prolactin was actually very high. It was 92%. For growth hormone, about 75%. And for Cushing's, it was a little bit less. Although it was higher for macroadenomas, this is a little bit confusing because normally for giant tumors, your rates go down. But we were actually fairly successful taking out big uh, cortisol-producing tumors. Um, like I mentioned, size is important. So the average size of the tumors we were able to cure 
was just over one centimeter, and the average size of the ones we current were just over one and a half centimeters. But you can see we were able to cure, uh, this is endocrinologic cure, some tumors as big as four centimeters and three centimeters. So it's not an absolute strict criteria, but it is weighted towards smaller tumors being e easier to cure. I put this slide up because um, it's important to know that not all pituitary tumor surgeons are the same. These are cure rates for acromegaly, uh, percent achieving growth, normal growth hormone levels or safe growth hormone levels, they say, among different surgeons. They don't tell you who the surgeons are. Um, someday we may have that information, but it just shows you that in one surgeon's hands you have a 20% rate of cure and in another's you have a uh, 68 or 70% chance of cure. So it's important to seek out a surgeon who does a lot of pituitary surgery. That's really the important thing. There are a lot of good pituitary surgeons out there. Um, you just have to go to one who's not a general neurosurgeon but specializes in pituitary tumors because these are usually not emergency operations or even if you're losing your vision. Um, you're not going to, it's not going to make a difference if you wait a week or two to go to someone who has some expertise uh, in that field. Um, I'm actually going to skip this slide. Um, so what about complications of, of surgery? Well, they're really not that different between the endoscope and the microscope, so we can't say that the endoscope is any safer or less safe. Um, so uh, these were uh, sort of meta-analyses and, and big case series showing the rate of CSF leak somewhere between 2 and 3.4 percent for either microscope or endoscope, and the rate of diabetes insipidus somewhere between 1 and 2 percent. Um, so for microadenomas, it, there's not a huge advantage to the endoscope, although uh, not making an incision is an advantage. Um, and one advantage, though, is for your microadenomas that are off to the side a little bit, we are trying to do this on block resection, take the whole thing out, that the endoscope may help you visualize invasion into the cavernous sinus so that you can look laterally. And as you saw with that first movie I, I showed, we were able to use an angled endoscope and look up to the bottom of the tu pituitary gland. Now for bigger tumors, for macroadenomas, um, the endoscope I think makes a huge difference. And that, that difference is in visualization because you can see around corners, you can see the side of the cella into the cavernous sinus, supracellar, clivus, all these areas that may not make sense to people, but I'll show you some images of them. That are all the areas around the midline where tumors can invade. In this cartoon I had drawn just to show that example, but you can see if we advance an endoscope into the cavity, and this is sort of the, the cell where the tumor would be, here's the normal pituitary gland that is squished, um, and these are where your carotid arteries are on either side. The tumor was here, we took it all out, but you can see there can be a little residual tumor that's off to the side, and it's very hard to see that if you're looking in with a microscope that's just showing you the view in the midline. You might miss it. But if you can take an angled endoscope, this endoscope looks this way, and then it looks off to the side, well, you're going to see that, and you'll be able to take it out. So here's an example of that. This is a patient of mine who had a tumor. Um, and let me see if you can, yeah, you can see the tumor. This is the cavernous sinus part of the tumor, this part off to the side. This is the part in the midline. And we were able to get all of that out. You, don't, you see the tumor's not there anymore. All you see is the normal stalk, the normal pituitary gland, the normal optic nerves, all in place. And that cavernous sinus tumor has been removed. Um, so you may read things about these extended approaches, extended endonasal approaches. And um, you know, we were instrumental in, in helping to develop those. Um, and they really are useful. And the idea is that when you're coming in to take out a pituitary tumor, you not only open up the bone over the pituitary gland or the cella, which is this bone here, but we extend our opening and we open up above. And by opening up above, if you have a giant tumor that goes up and pushes on the optic nerve, by taking off a little bit more bone, you can see that better. And I'll show you examples of, of why that makes such a big difference. So this is a patient with a, a big tumor. Um, and if we're coming in through the nostrils like this with our endoscope, all we're going to see if we just take off the standard amount of bone, which is this amount of bone, is we're going to see the tumor here. And that's going to be the easy part for us to take out. But the hard part is going to be this top part. All right? And we're not going to see it that well. Now we can use an angled endoscope to look up like that, or we can take off this little piece of bone here. And that's what the extended approach does. It takes off that piece of bone so that you can see this top piece of tumor. So you still see some of my scribbling there, but this just shows you the approach, actual approach that we used, and by taking off this little piece of bone, we could see above the top of the tumor, and there's that tumor. This is after the tumor's been removed. There's a little bit of fat in there, but the tumor's gone. 
Um, and again, this shows you the tumor gone, and this, we used a nasal septal flap in this situation to make sure there was no CSF leak. So this is an interesting case, and we see this from time to time, not that uncommonly. This is a patient who actually had pituitary tumor surgery done with a microscope. And the tumor got out, the patient, sorry, the, the surgeon got out everything that they could get out. But you can see there's still some tumor left behind. And this tumor that's left behind after the standard transphenoidal surgery is this supracellar tumor. It's a tumor that's high up into the brain that they could not see when they went in with a microscope because the opening was probably down here. You can see where they made their opening. They really couldn't see above. And so there's just showing you the tumor. When we went in and did our surgery, we did one of these extended approaches. We took off a little bit of more bone, and it's not much. You just take out a little bone here, and you see we got the whole tumor out. Um, let me tell you a story about a patient um, here uh, who, here she is at, at age 11, I'm um, sorry, at age 9, and here she is at age 11, and she's actually has gigantism. So she's gotten bigger than her mom. This is her mom here, very sweet woman. And she had a tumor that uh, was removed with, a, with an endoscope, but with someone who really wasn't so good at using the endoscope, and who said, I got out every last bit of tumor, and I can't get out any more tumor, and uh, it's unresectable. There's no way that, that anyone can take out any more of this tumor. And this tumor was making growth hormone, and she was growing at an incredible rate and had gigantism, was going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And they came to see me, and I said, look, I can take out this tumor using an endoscope. I can do an extended approach. You know, we've developed these approaches. We'll take out the rest of the tumor, and I think there's a decent chance we can cure her. And that's exactly what we did. There's the tumor, as I showed you before. Here's the tumor here. Let me just outline it for you. Um, it was not unresectable, and we went in and, and took it out. You see there's no tumor there. This is actually her normal pituitary gland, which we preserved. And this is the reconstruction we did. So we just went up a little bit higher. And here you see the normal optic nerves, the normal pituitary stalk, and the normal pituitary gland, but there's no tumor there. So we were able to cure her of her tumor and, and make a big difference in her quality of life by using the endoscope. And by using extended approaches, it really makes a difference. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of gigantic tumors. Um, this is all a tumor. It's a huge, huge tumor. And this is the kind of tumor that really benefits from the endoscope. This is another huge tumor. This whole thing is tumor. It's pushing up on the optic nerves. It's pushing down and eroding through what's called the clivus. Um, and here you see this, this is all tumor. But these are the carotid arteries here and here. This tumor is wrapped around the carotid arteries. So it's not really a curable tumor. But um, with an endoscope, we can take out 98% of it, really most of it. And what you'll see here is now the tumor is gone. This is just the flap we put in. But the tumor was all the way up here. Now this is just dark space. And this is actually the normal pituitary gland that's sagging down. But all of this cavity was tumor that we removed. You can see here we came in this way, and now it's just a black, empty space. And we actually went around this, the carotid arteries here. We went around them and took out the whole tumor. And then again, you see a different view. This is empty space. Where we took the tumor. Here's the normal pituitary stalk, the normal gland here. Everything below it's been removed. Here's another example of a gigantic tumor. You can see this. It basically, you know, is taking up most of the uh, uh, space at the base of the brain. Um, just a huge tumor. You see it here. Here's another example. Here are the carotid arteries. It's kind of wrapped around that a little bit. But you see that this whole thing is tumor. Very, very big. Right, it would be very challenging to take that out with a microscope. Um, but here with an endoscope, we were able to make a bigger opening, get it all out. All the tumor's gone. This is our nasal septal flap. This is a fat graft. The only tumor we left behind is this little bit right here. There's a little bit of tumor right here. And that will recede over time and then potentially could be treated with radiosurgery because it's so small. But all the tumor in the midline is gone. All right, so <clears throat> what are the rates of, of gross total resection, complete resection? Um, they're pretty high, around 93 to 98 percent um, in two articles. I'll show you some of our own data. And after microscopic resection, in other words, um, there are studies that have been done where they do the surgery with a microscope, and then they go in with an endoscope and say, hey, do we see anything left? About 40 percent of the time, you see some tumor left. So that's compelling data as well. We looked at some of our tumors um, and looked at a volumetric classification of them, uh, meaning that we classified them by their volume, not just their diameter, and also looked at some of the morbidity. And this was published a couple years ago. We've done a lot more patients, um, but this was our first 71 non-hormone-producing patients 
that were greater than a centimeter. And most of them presented with visual loss because these are all pretty big tumors. There were a variety of other uh, symptoms that they had. And in these, the average diameter was 2.5 uh, centimeters. The average volume, sorry, not average, the average volume was 8.6 cubic centimeters. And we had uh, uh, 23 patients with what we consider giant macroadenomas greater than 3 centimeters and 20 that had greater than 10 cubic centimeters. And this really is the useful measurement that we found was cubic centimeters rather than diameter. 66% um, had supercellular extension, 30% had invasion of the cavernous sinus. Obviously larger tumors more likely to invade the cavernous sinus. And just comparing these giant adenomas to the non-giant adenomas, greater operative time, a um, little more uh, blood loss, um, more likely to do uh, an extended approach. Uh, this is the giant tumors here, sorry. And then um, a lot of uh, intraoperative CSF leaks, but they didn't have post-op CSF leaks. They just had intraoperative CSF leaks. So that's a, a, a important distinction. So these are the results. Gross total resection rate was 76%, but you have to understand that 31% had cavernous sinus invasion, so we can't really take all those out. But our gross total resection for giant tumors was about 40%, but when we couldn't get them all out, this is our extent of resection, it was about 92%. So for the giant, giant adenomas, we got out 92% of the tumor. For all tumors, we got out about 97% of the tumor. Let me go back to my highlighting pen. Um, and so we looked at a gross total resection rate. Uh, so the X's are the ones that we got a gross total resection on. So if they were, you see most of the ones are down here where we got a gross total resection. And if they're red, they invaded the cavernous sinus. Okay, so you also see uh, less, fewer gross total resections in the, uh, that are red because they invade the cavernous sinus. But the important point here is that if you use 10 cubic centimeters as a cutoff, it's a much better cutoff for our ability to get a gross total resection, meaning there are many more X's over here and O's over here. And it's better than if you use three centimeters or four centimeters in making that determination. We did sort of statistics to prove that. What were our complications? Um, they were pretty low, actually. Um, one mortality, only in a giant, giant adenoma. Um, one CSF leak, uh, and that was in a non-giant adenoma. Um, a couple patients with diabetes insipidus and one vascular injury, but those rates are actually quite good uh, compared to the rest of the literature. Uh, subtotal resection was predicted by invasion of the cavernous sinus and volume greater than 10 cubic centimeters, as we mentioned before. So how did these results for giant tumors compare between endonasal endoscopic surgery compared to transcranial and transphenoidal? Is it any better? And the answer is yes, it's better at getting a gross total resection. So our gross total resection rate was 40% compared to the rest of the literature, 25-24% uh, using more traditional techniques. And our uh, our leak rate, CSF leak rate, was much lower. It was 0%. And the rest of the uh, risk factors were about the same. Mortality, diabetes, insipidus, about the same. And we published a paper, another paper, where we actually compared the results. Of, this is endonasal endoscopic surgery with uh, open transcranial surgery versus transphenoidal microscopic surgery. And this is only for giant adenomas. Okay, This is for the biggest, biggest, biggest tumors. And what we found was gross total resection rate was better for the endonasal endoscopic uh, surgeries were that, that it, not just in our hands, but in everybody's hands, they were able to get out more tumor when they used an endoscope and an extended approach. What about vision? A lot of these patients have visual loss. So who had improved vision? Well, the highest rate of improved vision, 90%, was with the endonasal endoscopic, which is light gray compared to doing a craniotomy or doing a transphenoidal microscopic, which are these groups. So visual outcome was better. So you can get out more tumor. You're more likely to improve vision. So what about complications? Are complication rates higher? The answer is actually no. They're lower for giant tumors. So if you look at endonasal endoscopic, CSF leak rate was much lower. It was almost zero compared to the other approaches. Uh, meningitis rate was lower. The only thing you get more of is sinusitis. And it's a little bit disturbing to the, to the sinuses, but you can treat this with antibiotics. It's a temporary problem. Hypopituitarism was lower with the endoscope, and mortality, meaning death, was much lower with the endoscope than doing a craniotomy uh, or doing a, uh, and a microscopic approach. So we use intrathecal fluorescein. What does that mean in our surgeries? Well, at the beginning of the surgery, we do a lumbar puncture, and 
we inject that green dye into the CSF. And the reason is that we want to see if there's a CSF leak rate. It's not toxic. Um, we've published on the safety of it. And if we see a leak, we fix it. Um, this is what it looks like. This was the paper we published showing its safety. Um, we looked then at a, a larger series of pituitary tumors, 203 cases, and we uh, had a protocol to try to prevent CSF leak after we take out the tumors. And we did different things based on the size of the tumor. And in the really big tumors, we would put in what's called a lumbar drain um, for 24 hours, and we would raise a flap. Uh, it's called a nasal flap to prevent CSF leak. These are tumors greater than two and a half centimeters. And this is what we found. So the rate of intraoperative leak, how often we see a leak with fluorescein, um, did increase with the size of the tumor. These are bigger and bigger tumors, showing that the leak rate in surgery goes up. But how many do these patients, how many of these patients actually have leaks after surgery? That's what's important, where they actually they are after surgery and there's fluid coming out of the nose. It's very, very low. That's this number down here, extremely low, and surprisingly 0% in our giant tumors. And so this is what we learned. Um, our first 50 cases, we were still sort of learning, and this is the learning curve, and this is why you want to go to an experienced surgeon. We had a 10% post-op leak, and then in the next 153 cases, we had a 0.7. This is very, very low. It's less than 1%. And as you saw from the literature, the leak rates are usually somewhere between 2 and 4% for all comers, and we've gotten it down to less than 1%. So in conclusion, the endoscope is a tool um, not a replacement for clinical judgment and surgical experience. That's still the most important thing. So you are in better hands seeing an experienced surgeon who uses a microscope than an inexperienced surgeon who uses an endoscope. Keep that in mind. Experience is really the most valuable thing. Um, for small hormone-producing adenomas, it may not add a significant benefit as long as uh, they do this extracapsular dissection and resection and that you have an uh, experienced surgeon. Um, but it may help visualize small remnants of residual tumor that have invaded the, the dura. But for large tumors uh, that invade the cavernous sinus, that go supracellar, that push on the optic nerves, that extend down to the clivus, it does increase visualization and appears to increase extended resection. So these extended approaches these, the, with the endoscope that we do um, increase the safety of the resection and also um, our ability to make larger openings and, and take out more tumor. And intrathecal fluorescein, we've shown, uh, we uh, feel is useful in um, identifying CSF leaks, which decreases the rate of CSF leak after surgery. So thank you very much. I appreciate your taking your time uh, this afternoon to listen to what I have to say. And I'm open to questions and, and uh, happy to respond. Thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, fascinating slides. I love the use of the pointer. That, that really helped us to be able to stay on track. And uh, we do have some questions, so I'm going to um, field some questions to you. Uh, the first question we have, um, I'm going to tag on a little bit. Oh, and I also want to mention that I'm really glad that you uh, point out the importance of finding an experienced surgeon. It's one of the things that the, here at the Pituitary Network Association we stress all the time. And we yeah. hear so many horror stories from patients who have not uh, chosen wisely or carefully their surgeon and um, sometimes the results are, are very sad. So uh, I think that's a really important um, uh, point to bring forward. Uh, in terms of choosing endoscope or microscope in, in dealing with a microadenoma, uh, we have a question about that. And I also ha would like to tag on in terms of uh, the efficacy and the use of the microscope, what would be the argument in favor? I mean, there must be some folks out there that have a strong um, prevalence for wanting to use the a microscope. Can you briefly summarize some of the reasons why, and would either one be better for a microadenoma? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think that for a given surgeon, um, you are going to be more comfortable using the visualization tool that you've been trained with in using all your career. So for a microadenoma, if you're comfortable using a microscope, then by all means, that's what you should be using. Um, and you're going to get your best results using that. Uh, if you're comfortable using an endoscope because you've been trained using an endoscope, there is not a negative to using the endoscope. Uh, and the issue is that it wouldn't make sense to use the endoscope only for your big tumors and a microscope only for your small tumors because 
as with any technical uh, uh, expertise, whether it's you know riding a bicycle or hitting a, a golf ball, um, we you would want to use the equipment that you're most comfortable with. So if you're comfortable using an endoscope for big tumors, well then you should use the endoscope for small tumors. And if you're comfortable using a microscope for small tumors, then the microscope will get you a better result. Now, for the big tumors, there's a lot of evidence showing that the microscope will not be as good. So once you've switched over to using an endoscope because you want to get better results with your big tumors, it doesn't really make sense to go back to the microscope just for the small tumors because you're comfortable using an endoscope, you use it in every case, um, and then you know the approach becomes different, and then you, you're sort of going back and forth from approach to approach. So the that's a long answer, but the shorter answer, the short answer is that if you do a lot of pituitary tumors with a microscope and your results are good with small microadenomas, then you should keep doing it with the microscope because the results are really not that much better with the endoscope for small tumors. It's really with the big tumors that it makes a big difference. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a question here from a patient um, that I'll describe. Uh, somebody that has a non-secreting macroadenoma that was debulked uh, by microscope seven years ago. It was a very firm tumor and could not be totally removed. It was pulled away from the chiasm. Uh, it had invaded the cavernous sinus and had grown minimally over the years. If it continues to grow, they say they may need additional surgery or radiation. And if so, how effective is the endoscope in resecting very firm fibrous tumors? And it, uh, I guess, is apparently about seven millimeters from the chiasm. Right. So um, the endoscope per se will not help you or hurt you with a firm or a soft tumor. Um, but there are other tools that we have that are very useful at removing firm tumors that are used more often with the endoscope because, um, you know, an endoscopic surgeon not only takes out pituitary tumors through the endoscope, but often we'll take out other types of tumors, chordomas and meningiomas, and these are firmer tumors. And so we've had to develop techniques to take out these firmer tum tumors, and new tools have been developed specifically to remove firm tumors. So the, the answer is not that the endoscope per se will help, um, although actually I can give you a couple reasons why it might, but the, the other tools that are used um, are the ones that are going to be more helpful, and the real question is, to ask your surgeon, if this is firm, what are you going to do? And do you have a backup plan? Because it's not just going to scoop out easily. But the other way in which the endoscope will help with firmer tumors is that if you go to a surgeon that does endoscopic skull base surgery, not just pituitaries, but skull base surgery, they will be comfortable making a bigger bone opening. And by opening up more bone, it gives you the ability to dissect around firmer tumors. The, the problem becomes, and, and a lot of the time when we go back and do re-operations for patients who've had previous microscopic surgeries, the bone opening is really small. And they make a small bone opening just in the midline and hope that soft tumor scoops out. And we're very comfortable making a much bigger bone opening, so it allows us to take out firmer tumors, not only because we have different instruments, but because with a bigger bone opening, you can get around the outside of these firmer tumors, and it makes it much easier to scoop it out. So I hope that answered your question. That sounds like a very logical uh, answer uh, that I can understand, so I, I, I presume that will be helpful for our listeners as well. Right. Um, the next question, uh, in part, I think I can answer, and uh, this person is in Canada and wanting to know how they can find uh, doctors with experience, and I would say, first, go to the PNA website. We have long lists of doctors, and also you can contact the PNA directly. We have some people up in Canada working on trying to help patients uh, and find a support system for patients. So um, be sure to, to check us out in, in that respect. Um, also, uh, the, the second part to the question is how to talk and ask a doctor about their experience without insulting the doctor. Do you have any right. suggestions? Yeah, um, you know, so I work on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And uh, as you can imagine, I have a lot of patients who don't mind insulting their doctors. And so, but honestly, it's not an insult. So I, I just mean I have a lot of patients who come in, and they want to know. They want to say, how many of these have you done? Uh, you know, how many pituitary tumors have you done? How many that look like this? They will ask me point blank how many I've done. 
and I can understand how some patients may feel uncomfortable doing that. And so, but I want you to know that first of all, you should feel comfortable asking your surgeon how many of these they do. The, the, the problem is you'll never know if they're telling you the truth or not, unfortunately. Um, hopefully they will. You know, we like to think that, that they will, but they may, you know, fudge the numbers up a little bit to try to give you more confidence in them. Um, so it's, it's tough to, to, to say that. I mean, I think you could certainly um, ask them how many they've done, ask them if they use an endoscope, ask them if they work with an otolaryngologist or do it by themselves. Uh, often, you know, if they do it by themselves, they may not do it endoscopically. Find out if the, you know, the otolaryngologist they work with uses an endoscope. Ask the otolaryngologist how many they've done and, and then see if it makes, corresponds to what the neurosurgeon um, said. Uh, but the, you know, the truth of the matter is sometimes it's very hard to know that information. Um, look, but you know, most surgeons have a website somewhere and it says what their areas of expertise are and if it doesn't say pituitary tumors on there, it doesn't say endoscopic surgery on there and it says something else, you have to wonder how many they do because if it, it really is what they do, then there should be, you know, that should be listed on their, on their website. Um, but I agree, it is very hard to, to know that information because most surgeons will try to give you the confidence that uh, in them that they know what they're doing and um, they may only do two or three of them a year, but that's, that's a good question. Well, doctor, and I love this question and I loved your response about being uh, uh, with so many New Yorkers. This, as a family therapist, I would say this may be one place where it's really good to be a New Yorker and have a New Yorker attitude to be able to, it's your body and it's really important to be able to step up and ask those hard questions and demand good, solid answers. So uh, I, I think this is one place where New Yorkers have it all over everybody else in the world. So, all right, another question. Um, if prolactin is elevated, elevated but medication is not decreasing its si at the tumor size, would the patient be a good candidate for surgery? And also, does that rule out the tumor as a prolactinoma? So uh, the answer is no, it doesn't rule it out as a prolactinoma. I mean, it depends how high, but if the prolactin is very high, uh, above 200, let's say, uh, 250, then it's most certainly a prolactinoma. Um, and it does not rule them out for surgery. In fact, that's an indication for surgery. Uh, we often operate on prolactinomas that do not respond to medication. That's a good indication for, for surgery. All right. Um, how do surgeons cover the quote-unquote hole through the bones? Yeah. So um, one of the things that we do, uh, well, first of all, there's, there's different types of holes. So we make a hole to take the tumor out. And then we face two scenarios. One scenario is that there is a leakage of brain fluid into the operative field, which is not uncommon if we take out a big tumor. Or we face a situation where there's not a leakage of fluid. And that's a different thing to close. So if there's a leakage of fluid, very often we will harvest a piece of fat from the belly. We'll make a little incision in the belly, take a little piece of fat, and put it up there. Uh, and then we'll uh, uh, sometimes buttress that, meaning uh, put a more solid piece of uh, bone that we've used maybe from the septum or a synthetic piece of a, a hard tissue that keeps the, the fat in place. And then that can be covered with sealants. Um, it can be covered with a flap of tissue that's either vascularized or non-vascularized within the nose to try to close that hole up. If there's no leakage of fluid, then we don't have to make a watertight closure. Uh, we don't need to harvest the fat. And so one option is to do absolutely nothing uh, because what will happen is that, that the pituitary gland will settle back into that space. So it's possible to leave everything open. Um, but some people will put some uh, graft material in there like gel foam uh, just to kind of fill up the dead space uh, and even buttress that in place because some people don't like it when the pituitary gland uh, herniates down into the operative field because there is a risk of pulling on the optic nerves, potentially causing some visual problems, although it's very rare for that to happen. We have a couple of uh, questions which I think are real solid about what is considered uh, to be the, the right number of surgeries to be considered an expert or to have the kind of expertise necessary for these kind of surgeries? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there have been any strict criteria that have been created. 
Um, but I would say uh, someone who does at least 25 a year is a good number of, of, of reasonable volume. There are surgeons who do many more than that. But I think if you're doing 25 a year and you've done that for at least three years, you're probably um, experienced enough to do a good job. I think if you're doing less than that or if you're out less than three years, then you know, you're still in your learning curve. Uh, so uh, I would try to find someone who is around that number. I mean, if it's 20, it's probably not, it's probably good enough as well. Here's a question that I, I don't understand. So do you use fascia lata? And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, so fascia lata um, is uh, you make, to make an incision in the thigh and to take out a piece of uh, the fascia lata is kind of that band that runs down the side of the thigh, so it's deep uh, to, to the thigh uh, skin. So the answer is no. Actually, we do not use fascia lata for pituitary tumors, we, but we do use fascia lata in endoscopic skull base surgery when we close up meningioma surgery or craniopharyngioma surgery. And those are tumors that are basically well inside the brain. They're deep in the brain and they require a little more uh, secure of a closure to present, prevent CSF leak. But we do not use fascia lata for pituitary tumors because they, the risk of postoperative CSF leak is much, much lower in them because they're extra arachnoidal tumors and usually they, they don't really leak very much. We have another, oh, we're getting towards the end here, but we've got, uh, if your cortisol is unable to suppress, what type of surgery is recommended? Um, so the, I, I think what they're referring to is when we make the diagnosis of Cushing's disease, we do a dexamethasone suppression test. And for patients who have Cushing's, they will suppress um, with a high dose, but not suppress with a low dose. So um, I'm not, I, when you say don't suppress, it's not clear to me if you mean with a high dose or with a low dose. Um, but if the diagnosis of Cushing's is ambiguous, then one can do what's called petrosal sinus sampling to see if the tumor is actually making uh, ACTH. Um, and you should talk to your doctor, uh, either endocrinologist or a neurosurgeon, about doing petrosal sinus sampling to see if indeed you have a uh, hormone-producing tumor and your ACTH level is not being driven by something somewhere else. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that was the best I could do. Yeah, she, she, the person did come back and say that her level would not come down. With high dose? Yeah. So if it doesn't suppress with high dose, it raises the possibility that there's an ectopic source, in other words, not in the pituitary. Mm -hmm. That maybe there's a tumor somewhere else, either in the adrenal glands or in the lungs, that's making ACTH, and you should really have a PET CT scan of your body. Um, I have a question. Uh, you had talked at the very beginning about the 10% prevalence rate uh, in the autopsy studies that is quoted yeah. quite frequently, yeah. and um, that obviously not everyone uh, was uh, under that study. We don't know whether they were symptomatic, but obviously not everybody uh, with a tumor is. Do you believe that we're catching all of those that have tumors in today's world. Do you believe uh, as a physician that we can do more or that there are many other people out there that have symptoms that haven't yet been identified by, you know, either their primary doctors or, you know, being referred to endocrine specialists? Um, I mean, I think there's probably no question that we're not catching all of them uh, because uh, well, there are two scenarios. One is a patient who is asymptomatic and has a pituitary tumor, and I would argue that, that we don't have to catch those to some extent because they, if you're asymptomatic and have a small tumor, you could live your whole life that way and never need to have surgery or never need to have it treated. Um, however, there are, are, then there's actually two other scenarios. One is a patient who has a, a tumor that is causing some symptoms because it's pushing on the pituitary gland and they're subtle and we don't know about it. Those are probably certainly underdiagnosed. And then there are patients that have hormone-producing tumors that are not caught uh, and not diagnosed. And those are underdiagnosed as well. So I think it's the hormone abnormalities uh, that we're missing. Uh, I mean, I'll even see patients, for example, that will have uh, cataract surgery because they're losing vision 
and then they all it turns out they had a giant pituitary tumor and nobody picked it up you know and they had unnecessary surgery on their eyes because they were losing vision so there's definitely tumors out there that need to be caught that physicians need, need to be more, made more aware of what the symptoms are of pituitary tumors to try to pick them up um, and that's about education and that's really what the PNA does and I think that's why it's such a valuable organization to try to educate uh, physicians you know but it's the internists who need to know more about this the general practitioners the nurse practitioners who need to be thinking about pituitary tumors um, not just you know obviously the, the neurosurgeons who specialize in it and the patients who have them are very aware of them it's everybody else we have to educate thank you very much uh, two more uh, questions in a, or one question in the comment will you use vascular vascularized <laughs> basis spatial flap in a, if a CSF leak? The answer is no. We only, we will harvest one if we have a big tumor. Um, so the answer is yes for big tumors, no for small tumors. So we use a vascularized nasal septal flap. Um, we harvest one in every case if the tumor is greater than two and a half centimeters and there's more than one centimeter of supracellar extension. And once we harvest it, we'll use it. Um, but if we have a CSF leak and we've not harvested a tumor, then not sorry, we've not harvested a nasal septal flap, we will not go back and harvest one. We will just close it with fat and you know uh, Medpour and some Duracell, and the chance of that leaking is very small because those tend to be very small leaks because they're small tumors. So we only use the nasal septal flap for the big tumors. And of the final question is how is how long is the usual postoperative hospital stay after endoscopic surgery? Roughly two days. Um, there is no absolute number. Uh, some people will try to discharge patients the next day. Some will keep them three days. I think there are different scenarios, and it has less to do with the endoscope than the surgery that's done in the size of the tumor. So. If you have a giant tumor and you undergo a big surgery and there's a huge leak and you have a flap and a lumbar drain, you're going to be in the hospital longer. You may go into DI for a day or two that may get better, and all that has to be sorted out in the hospital before you go home. You may Your normal pituitary gland may not work, and you have to sort that out and figure out if you need to go home on cortisol replacement or not for giant tumors. If you have a small tumor, then you can go home sooner because the risks are less. If you have a small tumor that makes cortisol and you have Cushing's, well, it would be nice to figure out while you're in the hospital whether you still have Cushing's or not, and that may take a couple of days. Obviously, you could be discharged on replacement cortisol right away, but um, then you'll never we'll figure it out for six months. So those patients may need to stay in the hospital a little longer with, just to figure out if they're cured or not. So there is no absolute number is the point I'm making. It depends on the surgery you have and how big your tumor is and what sort of hormones your tumor was making. So I think you have to tailor your length of stay based on the patient's pathology. Well, thank you. And I would like to um, conclude uh, today with a very lovely comment by someone here who says, I am happy to say that Dr. Schwartz was my surgeon and I was treated with the utmost respect and he and his staff never hesitated to answer any of my questions. Post four weeks post-op, I feel great. First class group of caring doctors. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. And oh, that's, that's just wonderful. And I would like to thank you on behalf of the Pituitary Network Association, Dr. Schwartz, for your time, for your efforts with all patients, and for your generosity in uh, spending the time here today. I'd like to thank everybody who was here uh, in attendance. Please remember that today's presentation will take a day or so to be able to get available through the PNA website. It will be up for a bit of time uh, free to, for anyone to see, and then it will be available in our library uh, only for membership. Um, and we have quite a few uh, webinar presentations now, so um, that, again, is a member benefit. I'd like to remind everyone that August 7th is our next webinar. Uh, we have Dr. Adriana Iomescu, who's going to be talking about pituitary hormone replacement in women. She's going to address causes, diagnosis, and treatment of pituitary hormone deficits in women, particularly that include adrenal, thyroid, ovarian, and growth hormone deficiency. So look for those announcements, and I hope everyone has a rest of your day, evening, whichever time zone you're in, and thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you.